Book 1, Chapters 19 through 21 of Amadis of Gaul. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nick Vega. Amadis of Gaul by Vasco de Lobera. Translated by Robert Southey. Book 1, Chapter 19. How Amadis fought with Agriote of Estrovaus and his brother, and conquered them. When the brother of Agriote saw him coming, he took his arms and met him, saying, Certes, knight, great folly have you committed in not granting our demand. Wherewith they gave the career against each other. The shield of Amadis was pierced, but the lance broke against his corslet. His antagonist was thrown back, yet held he fast the reins, so they broke, and he fell upon his neck in such plight that he knew nothing of himself. Hereon Amadis alighted and took off his helmet, and perceiving that he was in a swoon, drew him by the arm towards him. The knight then opened his eyes, and, fearing death, yielded. Amadis mounted again, for Agriota was already horsed, and had taken his arms and sent a lance to him. Soon they encountered so gallantly that the stove shivered, and both passed on, for they were good knights. When Amadis seized his sword, but Agriota cried, We may have the sword battle anon, and to your cost. Let us joust till yonder lances fail us, or till one be sent to the earth. And this he said, deeming that there was no knight in the world who could wield the sword better than himself. Sir, said Amadis, I have what to do elsewhere, and cannot so long tarry. What? Would you escape so lightly? I pray thee, one course more. They chose fresh spears, and met in the course so strongly that Agriote fell, and his horse upon him, and Amadis passing on fell over the horse of Agriote, and part of the spear which had gone through his shield was driven by the fall through his harness and into the flesh, though but a little depth. But he rose lightly as of one who would brook no shame for himself and in his lady's cause, and plucked the truncheon out, and went to his antagonist, sword in hand. Knight, said Agriote, Thou art a brave youth. I beseech thee, confess my lady is fairer than thine, before it be worse with thee. Such lie, quoth Amadis, shall my lips never utter. Then began a strife which could not long endure, for rather would Amadis have died than failed one jaw in, in this quarrel, and he laid on so fiercely that neither the great strength nor skill of Agriote availed him, for the sword came now upon his head, now upon his body, that the blood sprang from more than twenty wounds he as he could drew back of a truth knight there is more worth in thee than a man can think yield quoth amadis else if we end the combat thy life also will be ended and that should i repent for i esteem thee better than thou winnest this he said for his great goodness in arms and for the courtesy which he had used towards his mistress having her in his power agriote who could not choose gave himself up for vanquish saying believe me and not so much sorrow for my foil as for the wreckful chance that I this day lose the thing which I love best. That shall you not, said Amadis, if I can help you, and the lady will be ungrateful if she acknowledge not your honorable pains in her defense. I promise you to employ my endeavors in your behalf so soon as I return from a quest. Where, sir, shall I find you? In the court of King Nusuarte, answered Amadis. So he took so took he leave, and Agriote passed on with the dwarf. Five days they rode together, then the dwarf showed him a castle marvelously strong and pleasant. There is Castle Valdrin. Within that hold you must perform the promise made to me. Take your arms, for they suffer none lightly to go out who enter there. Amadis buckled on his helm and rode on first. The dwarf and Gandalin followed. They passed through the gate and looked round, and could see no creature. The place is deserted, quoth Amadis. So, said the dwarf, it seems. Why then hast thou brought me here? Sir, said the dwarf, there was here the fiercest knight that ever I saw, and the strongest in arms, who in that porch slew two knights. The one was my master, and him he slew cruelly, a man in whom there was no pity. The head of that traitor is the boon which I required. I have led here many knights to obtain vengeance, but for their sins they have either been slain or thrown into cruel prison. Thou dost the part of a loyal servant, said Amadis. 
yet oughtst thou not bring no knight here without telling him against whom he should fight? Sir, he answered, he is so known for one of the fierce, that if I named him, none would venture to accompany me. It is Arcalos, the enchanter. Again, Amadis looked round about if he might see anybody. He lighted and waited till Vespers, then asked the dwarf what they should do. Sir, said he, the darkness is at hand. It is not good to tarry here. Nay, trust me, answered Amadis, I will not budge hence till he come, or someone who can tell me tidings of him. I, said the dwarf, will not stay, lest he should see me and know me. Yet shalt thou, yet shalt thou stay, quoth Amadis, for I will not excuse myself from the promise, if I may perform it. And thus they communed. Amadis espied a court somewhat farther on, wherein he entered and found no one. But he saw a dark place with steps that went underground. Let us see what is here, said he. For God's sake, mercy, cried the dwarf. I would not for the world go down. But Gundolin caught him as he would have run away. Fear not, tall fellow, said he. And Amadis said, You shall not go till I have performed my promise, or till you see how it fares with me. Let me go, let me go, quoth the little wretch. I acquit the promise, for God's sakes, let me go, said Amadis, said Amadis. Thou shalt not say hereafter I have failed in my promise. I desire thee not to discharge me of it. By my faith I discharge you, said the dwarf, and I will wait for you in the road to see if you come. Go then, and good luck with thee, quoth the knight. I shall remain till morning. So the dwarf fled in haste. Amadis went down the steps so far as he could see nothing. He came to a plain ground. It was utterly dark, yet he proceeded, and groping along a wall felt a bar of iron, whereto there hung a key, and he opened the padlock of the gate. Heard he a voice say, Oh, God, how long shall this misery continue? Oh, death, why delayest thou to come when thou art so needed? He listened a while, but heard no one. He then entered the vault, having his shield about his neck and the helmet laced, and the sword in his hand, and passing further, he found himself in a great hall, where was a lamp burning, and he saw six armed men sleeping in one bed, and by them laying their shields and hatchets. One hatchet he took and advanced. Anon more than a hundred voices were heard, crying aloud, Lord God, send, send us death and deliver us. Thereat, thereat was Amadis greatly astonished, astonished, and the men who were asleep awoke. And then one said to the other, Take a, take a scourge and make those wretches silent who disturb us in our sleep. I marry will, said the other. And taking a scourge, he rose, but seeing Amadis, he stopped and cried, Who goes there? A strange knight. The man turned back and fastened the grate and roused his comrades. Leave him to me, said the jailer, and I will place him among, among the rest. This man was great and strong of limb, and taking his shield and hatchet, he advanced toward Amadis. If you fear death, lay down your arms, and if not, expect what my hatchet will give thee. Both raised their hatchets at once, and at once both blows fell. The jailers entered far into the knight's helmet. The knights pierced through the shield of his enemy, who drew back, and so plucked the hatchet from his hand. Then Amadis drew his sword. The other grappled with him, confining in his strength. But Amadis, with the pummel of his sword, drove at his face and broke his jaw, and shook him off. Then followed that stroke with such another that he never needed a surgeon. Then, sheathing his sword, he recovered the hatchet from the shield, and so played his part with the other five that only two escaped death by falling at his feet for mercy. Show me the prisoners, said Amadis. They led the way. Who lies here? said he, hearing a lamentable voice from a cell. A lady, said they, in great torments, and taking two keys from the jailer's girdle, he unlocked the door. But she who believed it was her old tormentor exclaimed, Kill me, man, and do not inflict so many martyrdoms. O king, in an evil day was I beloved beloved by you since that love has cost me so dear the tears came over the eyes of amadis for great pity lady said he i am not he whom you think 
but one will, who will if he can deliver you. And he called for light. And when the soldier brought it, he beheld a lady chained round the neck with great with a great chain, and her garments fretted and worn through to the skin. Wretched as you behold me, said she, yet I am the daughter of a king, and thus tortured for a king's sake. So he caused the chain to be taken off, and commanded garments to be brought to her. And she covered herself with the scarlet mantle of the jailer, and he led her from the prison. There met them one at the gate, who called out to the soldier with the light. Her callus demandeth where the knight is that entered, whether he be dead or taken. At these words the man let fall the torch with exceeding fear, and could make no reply. Villain, quoth Amidus, what fearest thou? Being under my guard, go on. Then they ascended the stairs, and came into the open court. The night was far spent, and the moon was clear above. But that poor lady, beholding the heavens and feeling the air, fell on her knees and cried, O oh, gentle knight, God protect thee and give thee thy reward. Then Amadis, raising her, looked around for Gandolin, and finding him not, he feared, and exclaimed, If the best squire in the world be slain, I will take such vengeance as never has been heard of. Presently he heard a cry, and following it, found the dwarf hanging by one leg from a beam over a fire of stinking smoke, and near him Gandolin tied to a post. Him he was about to untie, but the squire cried, The dwarf first, for he is in worse case. And Amadis, holding him, by one, holding him in one hand while he cut the cord, set him on his feet, then set Gandolin at liberty, and said to him, In sooth, my friend, he who placed thee here did not love thee as I do. He went toward the castle and found the portcullis down. Gandolin showed him the place where his horse was stabled. He burst the door and took him out, then seated him on a stone bench in the wall with the lady. For though he wished to deliver the other prisoners, yet durst he not leave her. So there he awaited daylight. Meantime he asked the lady for what king's sake she had suffered sir said she our callus mortally hates him and therefore he revenged himself upon me he sees me in the presence of many friends and covering me with dark cloud carry me away and from that time till now i have never seen daylight and this he did as the worst evil he could do to my lover king arbin of north wales it is he quoth amadis now god be thanked for dearly do i love that knight but now do I not so much pity you as before, since you have suffered for the sake of one of the best men in the world. When it was day, a knight looked from a window and asked Amadis, Art thou he who has slain my jailer and my servants? Art thou he, answered the Amadis, who so treacherously murderest knights and imprisonest dams and damsels? Thou art the worst disloyal and cruelest knight in the world. As yet you know not, all my cruelty, Arcalus replied, and left the window, and soon they saw him enter the court, well armed upon a lusty courser. Now this was one of the largest knights in the world who were not giants, and Amadis looked at him with admiration, thinking that he must needs be a great strength. Why lookest thou at me so earnestly? quoth the castellan. Because thou wouldst be so good a knight, were it not for thy foul disloyalty. I come in good time, quoth Arcalus, to be preached at by one like thee. As with that he laid lance in rest, and ran the charge. Their spears broke, horses and bodies met, and both horses were driven to the ground. Quickly the knights arose, and began a fierce combat which lasted long. At length the Castilian drew back. Knight, said he, thou art in the chance of death, and I know not who thou art. Tell me that I may know, for I think rather to slay than to take thee. My death, Amadis replied, is in the will of God, whom I fear, and thine is in the will of the devil, who is wary of helping thee, and will now let thy soul and body perish together. You ask my name, I am Amadis of Gaul, the knight of Queen Brisena. Then renewed they their combat with fresh fury till about the hour of tears. 
then arcalus waxed faint and amadis smote him down and as he rose staggered him with another blow on the helmet so that seeing himself near to die he fled into the place and amadis followed but he running into a little chamber and the door whereof stood a lady beholding the battle took up a sword for he had dropped his own in the court and called to amadis come in and finish the fight this hall is larger answered amadis let it be let it be here i will not come out quoth the castilian what quoth the gaul thinkest thou to save thyself and placing his shield before him he entered the chamber his sword being raised to strike immediately the strength of all his limbs was gone and he lost his senses and fell to the ground like a dead man thou shalt die by no other death than this said arcalus what say you my lady have i well avenged myself and with that he disarmed amadis who knew nothing of what was doing and put on the armor himself and said to his lady as you regard yourself let none remove this knight till his soul shall have forsaken his body then he descended into the court and said to her whom amadis had delivered seek for some other to rescue you for this champion is dispatched and when gandolin heard these words he fell down senseless arcalus took the lady and led her where amadis lay in that deadly trance and she seeing him in such flight wanted no tears to express the abundance of her grief as soon as he is dead said arcalus to the other lady who was his wife place this woman again in her prison i will go to the court of king lisuarte and there relate how i performed this battle upon condition that he who conquered should cut off his enemy's head and within fifteen days publish his victory at that court by these means none shall challenge me about his death and i shall obtain the greatest glory in the world having overcome him who conquered every one then he went into the court and ordered gondolin and the dwarf to prison but gondolin reviled him with the names of traitor and villain and provoked him to kill him desiring death arcalus made his men drag him by the leg to a dungeon if i killed thee said he thou wilt endure no farther pain and there thou shalt have worse than death he then mounted upon the horse of amadis and accompanied by three squires set forth for the court end of chapter 19 chapter 20 of amadis of gaul of the battle which amadis had with arcalus the enchanter and how he escaped from his enchantment grindalaya the lady whom amadis had delivered made such dole over him and was pitiful to hear the wife of arcalus comforted her so well as she could for she was of disposition clean contrary to her husband and always besought god in her prayers to turn his heart as they were thus together they saw two damsels enter the hall each bearing in her hands many lighted candles which they placed along the sides of the chamber wherein amadis lay the ladies who beheld them this while being neither able to speak nor move one of the two damsels took a book from a casket which she brought under her arm and read from it aloud and at times a voice answered her and presently the answers were made by many voices together as though a hundred and all in the chamber then there came another book through the floor of the chamber whirling as if driven by the wind as if stopped at the feet of her who read and she took and broke it into four parts and burnt them at the sides of the chamber where the candles stood then she went to amadis and took him by the hand arise sir for you lie uneasily and amadis arose and cried holy mary what is this i was well nigh dead certes sir knight replied the damsel such a man as you should not perish in this sort for by your hand must others die who better deserve it and with that without more words both damsels returned thither from whence they came then amadis asked what had passed and grindalaya told him all i felt him disarm me said he but all seemed as in a dream then arming himself and in the harness of arcalus he said to his wife look to this lady well till i return and he went to deliver gandolin the men of arcalus seeing him thus armed ran all ways but he descended the steps 
and through the hall where he had slain the jailer, and so to the dungeon. A dreadful place it was for the captives, and length a hundred times as far as a man's spread arms can reach. One only and a half of that span wide, dark for neither light nor air could enter, and so full that it was crowded. Amidus came to the door and called, Gandolin! But he, who was like one dead, hearing the voice, was greatly terrified, and made no answer, for he believed that his master was slain, and he himself enchanted. Gandolin! Where art thou? again cried Amadis. O oh God, will he not answer? And he said to the prisoners, Tell me, for God's sake, is the squire living whom they have just now cast here? But then the dwarf knew his voice and answered, Here we are! Thereat, greatly rejoicing, Amadis went to the lamp in the hall and kindled torches and took them to the dungeon and loosed Gandolin's chain, for he lay nearest the door and bade him deliver his comrades. They came from the dungeon, and hundred and fifteen men in all, of whom thirty were knights, and they followed Amadis, exclaiming, O fortunate knight, ever so did our Savior go out from hell, leading away his servants from who he had delivered. Christ gave thee thy reward. And when they came to the sunlight and open sky, they fell upon their knees, and with lifted hands blessed God, who had given that night strength to their deliverance. Amadis, seeing their faces so pale and overspent that they seemed like dead rather than living creatures, was moved to exceeding compassion. One amongst them he remarked for his better shape and stature, who came forward and asked what they should call their deliverer, and hearing it was Amadis, replied that he also was a knight of Lisuarte's court, being by name Rando Yuas. Right glad was Amadis thereof, for he had often heard his good report, and the sorrow that there was for his loss. The other prisoners then confessed their bounded duty to him, and desired him to appoint what they should do, and he willed them each to do as he thought best. They telling him that they, wherever they might be, they should be at his command, departed. Brando Yuas and two squires only remaining with Amadis. They now went to the wife of Arcalus. Lady, said Amadis, for your sake and the sake of these women, I forbear to set the castle on fire. She answered him weeping, God is witness of the trouble and grief I endure for my husband's evil ways, but I must obey him and pray for his amendment. Now I am at your mercy. Then Amadis requested arms for Brando Yuas and fit garments for Grindalaya. Give them, said he, if it please you, at your free will. The horse and arms of Arcalus I must take, for he hath taken mine, and with them a sword of more value than all this. This is this the dame willingly accorded, and she besought them to take food before they departed. And the best viands were brought forth that so short warning could afford. But Grindalaya could not eat, uneasy to be gone. Whereat the knight smiled, and still more at the dwarf, who could eat nothing, and scarcely could he speak, and his color was gone. Dwarf, said Amadis, shall we wait for our callus, that I may give thee the boon which you released? Sir, said he, so dear hast thou cost me, that never while I live will I beg another. Let us go before the devil comes back again. I cannot stand upon the leg he hung me by, and my nose is so full of the brimstone smoke of the fire that I can do nothing but sneeze. So after they had repassed, they took leave of the dame, and she commending Amadis to God, said, I pray that God, that there may be peace between my lord and you. Set this, lady, quoth he, however that may be, there will be peace between you and me, for you have deserved it. And the time came when these words greatly profited that lady. They departed together, and on the second day separated. Grindalaya and Brando Yuas going to the court of Lisuarte, Amadeus pursuing his search. And where wilt thou go, my friend? Said he to the dwarf. I would remain to be your servant, quoth he. And he kissed the hand of Amadeus as his master. Not far have they traveled, when they met one of the damsels who had disenchanted him. She was lamenting loudly, and Amadis inquired, Wherefore? Yonder knight has taken a casket from me, which will not profit him, 
though with its contest the best knight in the world was delivered from death by me and my companion whom another knight hath now carried off with design to, to force her now the damsel knew not amadis by reason that his fever was closed but he forthwith galloping on overtook the knight and soon forced from him the casket and restored it to the damsel and then hasted to her friend's deliverance her he found struggling with the knight who seeing him took his arms in an evil hour dost thou hinder me of my of my will god confound such a will quoth amadis if i do not revenge myself said the knight i may never carry arms the world will lose little by that quoth the gall and meeting him in full career drove him to the earth with a force that broke his neck and then trampled him under his horse's feet Amadis took off his helmet, and immediately the damsels knew him, and he remembered her, for it was she who had led him to deliver Urganda's friend from Castle Bradoyud. By this her companion with Gandolin was come up, and they both embraced him, and thanked him for their deliverance. On my faith, said he, in worse danger was I when you succored me. How knew ye of my plight? She who had taken him by the hand answered, my aunt Urganda bade me ten days ago hasten to be there by that hour, so Amadis commended himself to that his true friend, and courteously taking leave of the damsels, they departed each on their way. End of chapter 20 Chapter 21 How Arcalus carried tidings to the court of King Lisuarte that Amadis was slain, and of the lamentations that were made for him. Such speed made Arcalus in the armor and on the horse for him who he had enchanted, that on the tenth day he met King Lusarte riding abroad on the morning to take the air, accompanied with a great train. They, seeing the horns and arms of Amadis, were greatly rejoiced, and rode on to welcome him. But coming nearer, they saw that it was not he for whom they looked, for Arcalus had his head and hands unarmed, and they were greatly amazed. Arcalus came before the king and said, I come, sir, to acquit a promise wherein I stand bound, to let you understand how I have slain a knight in battle, and I'll bet I must be content to declare mine own praise, which were more honorable for me being reported by another in mine absence, yet am I constrained to do no less, for the covenant was between me and him whom I have slain, that the conqueror should cut off the other's head and present himself before you if he slew me, I told him it was Arcalus whom he would slay, and much was I grieved when he said that he was the queen's knight, and by name Amadis of Gaul. In this guise came he to his death, and I remain with the honor of the battle. Holy Mary! Is, exclaimed the king. Is the best knight in the world slain? And with that they all began to lament. But Arcalus turned back by the way he had came, and all cursed him and besought God that he might speedily die an evil death, which they with their own swords would at once have given him but for his own tale. How Amadis was slain in an accorded battle. Forthwith the king returned in heavy affliction, and the news spread and reached the queen's house. And she and all her ladies lamented, for greatly was Amadis beloved by all. But Oriana, hearing their lamentation, sent the damsel of Denmark to inquire its cause who presently returned beating her face and with a wild cry looked at oriana ah lady what grief what a misery so that oriana trembled from head to foot and exclaimed holy virgin if if amadis should be dead the damsel answered ah me he is dead and with that oriana's heart died away within her and she fell then ran the damsel to Mabilia, tearing her hell, Help! Help! For my lady is dying, Mabilia! Though her own grief was so great, the greater none could be. Yet not for that did she neglect what remedy might profit. She took the princess in her arms and poured cold water on her face and bade the damsel fasten the door of the chamber, that none might see her in that passion. She, recovering her senses, exclaimed, Oh, friend, let me die and be at rest. Why would you make me so faithless that I should lie even an hour after him? 
What though his dwelling be in cold water, where all love ceaseth, yet greater shall our loves when in the other world we are united. And then again she swooned, her long hair hanging on the ground, her hands clenched upon her breast, that Mabilia thought that she was indeed dead, and cried, Oh God, let me die also, since, since they whom I loved best are gone. For God's sake, dear lady, quoth the damsel, let not your good sense fail you now, when it is so needed. Roused by these words, Mabilia recovered herself. They placed Oriana in bed, and poured water again upon her face, and upon her breast, so that she revived. Take heart, said Mabilia, and do not so easily believe such tidings. That knight may have borrowed the arms of Amadis, and, or stolen them. Who shall vouch for his truth? But or Oriana had fixed her eyes upon the widow where first she talked with Amadis, and in a faint and feeble voice exclaimed, How bitter is the remembrance that thou existeth! Long as thou shalt last, never will two others discourse in thee with such pure and perfect truth. Think you, said Mabilia, that if I believe his death, I should have power to comfort you? And thus, with such consolation, all that day they strove to cheer her who would not be comforted, and that the night was worse than the day, and oftentimes they feared that she would never see the morning. But the next day, at the hour when they were about to lay the napkins before the king, Brando Yuas entered the place, leading Grindalaya, and they both went and knelt before the king. He who greatly esteemed him and had been troubled for his long absence inquired where he had tarried. Sir, said he, in a dungeon, whence I should never have come out, but for the good knight Amadis, who delivered me and this lady and many others, doing there such deeds of arms as only he could have achieved. And he would there have been slain by the worst treason that ever was known, but the, by the traitor Arcalus, if two damsels had not helped him, who surely must not a little have loved him. Lisuarte, at this, rose instantly from the table. Tell me, my friend, by... By the faith which you owe to God and to me, is Amadis alive? By that faith, replied Brando Uas, I left him alive, and well not ten days ago. Then there was such joy as greater could not be. The king sent Grindalaya to Brisena, and well was she welcome for her tidings. The damsel of Denmark soon heard it, and hastened to Oriana, and restored her from death to life. And Mabilia sent for Grindalaya that they might hear the whole from her own mouth and the princess would suffer her to eat nowhere but at their own table that she might relate it at more length on her return to the queen's apartment she found king arban of north wales who dearly loved her then was there such joy as cannot be expressed and king arban told brisena how she was daughter of king android of serilis and brisena as well for her high rank as for the good tidings she had brought, besought her to remain in the court, to the which she was nothing loth. Brisena also sent for Grindalaya's sister, Aldeba. This was she who was the friend of Galaor, and for whose sake he had been so persecuted by the dwarf. So there were great rejoicings in the court of King Lisuarte. End of chapter 21 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nick Vega, May 2010, in Napa, California.